Hey guys, thank you for tuning in to another episode of InRange. We are back again today at the ruins of the Dragoon Springs Stagecoach Stop. This, this stagecoach stop, along with many others, was being built by the Butterfield Stagecoach Company to make essentially a travel agency across the West. Previously we did a video in which in the 1860s a bunch of Confederates were actually killed out here by Apaches. In fact, their graves are 20 yards to my right. Check that video out if you haven't already seen it. However, during the construction of this site, a truly epic life and death story happened here. It began with a massacre and a story that is insurmountable in terms of the will to survive and the ability to deal with adverse conditions. We're bringing that to you next. So I'm standing at the center of the ruins of the stagecoach stop. These locations were very carefully picked. This is still navigable terrain, and in fact, the actual stagecoach route is right in front of me, and that's the reason that this is located here. However, one mile distant is the actual Dragoon Springs. So that, mind you, that water was not at this site. If you needed water, you had to go to that spring as a daily occurrence and bring back water for the needs of not only your men, but your animals. So the reason these places were chosen was not only that it was accessible by the stagecoach, but also there had to be a water supply nearby to keep the people and animals alive in that purpose. Animals were kept here for not only food, but also to change out for the stages. The stage would go from one stop to the next, and at the next stop they would get fresh water and food, or maybe even new horses, the tired horses we put into the corral, the new horses on the stage, and they'd go to the next location. So there really was a pattern to this, and that's why this one is particularly built here. So to give you an idea of the architecture of this site, this would have been an open corral. There's probably no roof here. In fact, there was a flagpole in the center indicating the people were here, the stage is coming, they see the flag up, they know that this is being occupied at the time. There was a corral here that was kind of walled off, and then there was some shelter for the men. There's a room in the northeast corner, a room in the southeast corner, and those had roofs on them, and that's where men were able to stay and rest and, uh, and have some shelter from the sun and heat, because this is still a very hot, arid area. So, as you can imagine, this was a remote location. It is still a remote location. In fact, there's really very few signs of humans out here whatsoever. Off in the distance, there's some houses, but we're talking in the distance. This is remote. So, to get the kind of men that want to come out here and do this work, they're a special breed. There were six contractors hired for the purpose of building this particular stagecoach stop, and they hired three Mexican contractors to help with the labor. So these men are out here. You have a man named St. John, Lang, Cunningham, and Burr. The other two I don't know the names of. They actually left the location the night before to go on a ride to the river. So Wednesday night, everyone's going to bed normally. Burr is sleeping right in front of the gate of the stagecoach stop. St. John is staying in this room here on the northeast corner. Cunningham is in the southeast corner in that room. And Lang was staying right here where I am. There was a bed essentially in this open air area. You gotta remember this was in the summertime at this, at the, when this event occurred. It's hot out here. Even in this beautiful area of the country, it's still warm. Sleeping outside is normal. Thursday morning at 1 a.m., St. John awakens in his room hearing screams and blows. I'm standing in St. John's room. This is the room he was sleeping in on that fateful night. These are the ruins of the original structure. Nothing has changed. These are the dimensions of the room. It's a very small, confined space, as you can tell. He jumps up out of bed just in time to see the three laborers coming through this very small doorway. Two of them armed with axes, one with a stone maul. They immediately begin to attack him. His left arm is severed just below the shoulder. He's gashed across the right side. His right arm, probably in a defensive mood, part of his fingers are cut off and gashed down his right arm. At some point, he was able to pick up a sharps rifle and deflect one of the blows and knock the axe out of one of their hands. They're really surprised by the fact that this guy's still standing. It's been described that St. John was the big guy of the group, and it kind of makes sense that they, he was the last one to attack. If one of each of these guys attacked one of the three men outside, they then converged on him thinking that that would ensure their success. Turns out, they were wrong. He was able to fight them, hot, fight them off bare knuckled and with a rifle in his hand. As they back off slightly to understand what's going on, he tries to raise the rifle, can't quite do it, it's too heavy. He's got one arm, one hand, partially wounded, drops the rifle, they come back to attack again, he picks up a revolver and fires a shot. We don't know if the, if the shot hit, we don't know what it did, but it did have the desired effect. They take off. They book out the door and run off to never be seen again. They were never found. Realizing his attackers were not coming back, St. John took the time to bind his wounds to the best he could, slumped against the wall and waited for daylight. Daylight comes. St. John has tourniqueted his most severe wound, his lacerated left arm, with a handkerchief, a stone, and a stick. You know, it tells you something about the kind of men that came out to do this sort of work on the frontier. They were really 
not only tough, but also intelligent enough to have some basic medical capabilities. A lot more can be said for them than, unfortunately, some of our modern society. That being done, St. John decides he needs to go out of his enclosure to figure out what's happened to his compatriots. He leaves his enclosure, comes out to the corral area, the open area, finds Lang laying here, mortally wounded, still alive, not conscious, dying. Cunningham is in the southeast corner, three blows to his head, still alive, also unconscious. The entrance of the stage stop, where Burr was sleeping outside, described his head as completely crushed and obliterated, already dead. Realizing there was nothing he could do, and it was getting hotter, remember, it's now morning, it's getting hot, St. John crawled back into his enclosure, as they say, already starting to suffer from fever, thirst, hunger, blood loss. There's no water at the corral. He lays down, probably waiting to die. Nothing better to do but lay as an enclosure trying to escape the sun with no water. Nighttime comes. The animals are also waiting for food and water. That's why they're in the corral. Not only that, there's three men around them. Two of them dying, one dead. Animals can sense that. They're agitated. They don't have water. They're dying from dehydration and thirst as well. So he's laying here listening to two of his men dying, death rattling and gurgling with agitated animals circling within here, wondering why they're not being fed and watered. Around midnight, it says, Cunningham finally expired. His last breath happened. Cunningham's gone. So what we have left is St. John in here trying to not die from his wounds. Lang, still laying in the center, still breathing but dying. Burr's head crushed in. Cunningham now gone. St. John literally has nothing better to do but to lay here and die. This stagecoach stop is just getting completed. The actual stage run isn't in effect. There's no help coming. What do you do? His friends are dying, sitting here death rattling, laying against the wall with an arm essentially cut off, tourniqueted with a handkerchief, fingers severed from his right arm, and a gash against his right side. No water, no food, nothing to do but to wait. Well, there is something to do. Buzzers start coming in and tearing at his dead friends. Laying at some point expired, and now the birds are in here tearing and mutilating these bodies. So he sits there, wondering when it's going to be his turn for these birds to be tearing at his eyes. Another day, night falls. The birds are still tearing at these, at these bodies. However, a new predator comes in. Wolves come in to feast on Burr's dead body, only feet away from where St. John is lying. He's laying here, looking at his friend, being eaten by not only birds, but now tor being torn apart by predatory dogs. That's a little bit much for him. He's got a couple rounds left in his revolver. He would occasionally fire a pot shot at him. The dogs would depart, but ultimately slink back in. Still laying here, no help to be found. Body is now mutilated, animals agitated. It's probably getting a little quieter. All you're thinking about probably is what's left to do besides wait. Finally, some good news in this horrific story. A traveling correspondent referred to as Mr. Archibald is coming up to the stage stop. Don't have necessarily any information about why he was traveling this path besides he was a traveling correspondent following the path and trail. He immediately notices there's a mauled dead body in front of the stage stop and, kudos to him, has the wherewithal to go in and investigate and see what's going on. Finds three other or two other dead men and St. John essentially nearly dead. Realizes this man is in desperate need of water, rushes one mile to the spring and brings water to St. John, probably saving this man's life. They said that St. John's mouth was so parched that he could barely get the water in and he fed him the water carefully until he got enough water into him where he felt that it gave him enough opportunity to go ride to Fort Buchanan and go get help. So, Fort Buchanan is not exactly a hop, skip, and away. Even now, today, in this part of the world, things are far apart. St. John is left once again isolated in his room as Archibald goes for help. At least at this point, he has water. He knows it's going to be days before that help arrives. Finally, the surgeon from Fort Buchanan arrives. Mind you, this is nine days after the wounding. His left arm is hanging literally by a string, the blood loss prevented by a handkerchief, a stone, and a stick. If this isn't testimony to the 
will to survive and what you can do with mental strength, I don't know what is. That being said, the doctor finally actually performs a proper amputation on the arm. Cuts it off, cleans the wound. It's said that his right side, he did not die from the wound on his right side because of maggots. It's interesting that maggot therapy is actually still something used today and these maggots naturally occurred in his wounds. Not only taking some of the bacteria and infection away, but also potentially preventing some of the bleeding that would have occurred otherwise. So, after the doctor performs this, uh, this operation, six days later he's actually determined to be strong enough to be transported to Fort Buchanan. They bring him to Fort Buchanan. He ultimately fully recovers. This man becomes healthy once again, missing an arm, fingers messed up, but alive and healthy. He dies at the age of 84 in San Diego in the year 1919. Amazing testimony to the strength of the individuals that, that brought the frontier to what it is today, and amazing testimony as well to the triumph of one person's will to survive. You know, the Old West wasn't as violent as the media wants to bring it out to be. The reality is it was actually a pretty safe place. In fact, if you look at the murder rates and the crime rates in places like New York and Baltimore at the time, they were horrendous. You were much safer, actually, in some of these frontier locations, maybe not against the Apaches, but in some of the frontier towns than you ever were in the metropolitan areas of the East Coast. But, being that this was such a remote part of the country, if evil was your desire, and that was your trade, locations where men aggregate, like the Dragoon Stage Stop, or others like Brunkhouse Cabin, were the places to ply your trade. Stories like this are so amazing and epic that they went into the modern media at the time, and it led to this idea of the wild, violent Old West. It's still an idea that really is prevalent today, even though it really isn't all that correct. Guys, thank you for watching. If you like this kind of content, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We really appreciate it. Patreon is what enables us to really do this kind of stuff. If you can't support us on Patreon, totally get it. Please just subscribe to our videos, both on YouTube and Full30 and share it with your friends. We hope that this type of Old West content is something that a lot of people will find interesting, and it's really an important part of our history and culture.